State University will be joining us virtually. Um, and I, um, but I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Julie Silver, um, who's here with us today. So I'm going to take a second to introduce her. She'll proceed with her talk, and then we'll have lots of time for questions at the end. Um, so Dr. Silver is an associate professor and associate chair of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School, and also works at the Spalding Re Rehabilitation in Mass General and Brigham Women in Hospital. She's an associate, oh, I already, she is on the medical staff at Mass General um, and has developed and directs the successful Harvard Medical School Women's Leadership CME course, which has trained thousands of women in medicine. She's a subject matter expert on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and has published many, many <laughs> studies and reports in high impact journals across numerous specialties. Dr. Silver has received many awards for her work, including the Elizabeth Blackwell Award, which is the highest honor conferred by the American Medical Women's Association. She has received the Mentor of the Year Award across the Mass General Brigham system, as well as Harvard Medical School Mid-Career Dean's Award for supporting women faculty. Dr. Silver is also the recipient of numerous awards from professional societies, including the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, the Association of Academic Physiatrists, and the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Silver um, with us today. I am going to go ahead and get her PowerPoint presentation up. I think you're ready to go, just with the arrows or the clicker. Wonderful, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today and, and to talk about gender equity um, uh, from an ethical perspective. As I go through uh, the work that I've done and sort of how I, how I think about this, I wanted to share with you that there's a whole bunch of literature in these different categories that sort of influence my work. So I'm constantly looking at um, what's been being published in terms of laws and legal theory, in terms of corporate responsibility, um, social norms, all these different things. So it's it's important to kind of um, know that there's these these bodies of literature. So you don't have to deal with that the whole time. Great. Move it up. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So I think, um, you know, this by now, since you've been focusing all year on gender equity issues, I probably don't need to ask this question, but I do think it's a really important one to kind of just start with, you know, are there equity problems, you know, in science and, and medicine and, and, you know, are these focused on, on gender? Yeah, on one second, because it's, there we go. Okay. So I think one of the most important studies that's come out really on this topic was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was one of the most discouraging studies that I've read um, and have thought about. And that is because equity and uh, equity progress is sort of assumed. Now, what if we were doing something, you know, let's say giving a vaccine or giving a, a certain medication and and data showed that for 35 years, it didn't work. Would we still be doing that? I mean, that's just like so remarkable to base study like this saying for 35 years, what we've been doing hasn't worked. Now, what we've been doing in all fairness might've been, might been necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? So if we said, look, um, you know, we've been doing these things and, and they were important, but it wasn't su sufficient to move the bar. We have to believe the data and we have to believe science. So this is really a talk for people that believe science. That it, that's it. Like, if you don't believe science, you, you really, I don't really have anything to say. All right. So, you know, feel free to leave if you don't believe science. So here we are, you know, 35 years in, and we've got to figure out something new and different. And we certainly need to really care about intersectional identities as well, um, not just women in general, but also um, women who have intersectional identities. And a lot of the research hasn't been done on people with intersectional identities, um, but I wanna just highlight that this is very important. 
And to highlight that, and just to kind of show the progress, there's this concept called inexorable zero. And um, one of the really, really smart um, statisticians that I work with, who's done a lot of uh, um, work in the legal system, in um, statistics and court cases and things like that um, that have to do with um, the workforce, he, can't, he told me about this idea that statisticians use called um, the inexorable zero. And the inexorable zero actually is really interesting. It's been used by courts, including the US Supreme Court, to establish a prima facie and on its face inference of discrimination. So when you see a, a true zero or near zero number, you can infer discrimination unless there's some type of proof that discrimination didn't happen. So at its on its face, you know, at face value, you infer discrimination. And that's been used in a lot of race cases and things. So I said the inexorable zero, because again, it's a true zero or near zero number. I said it at zero to 1%. And I redid calculations that have been you know, shown in different ways. I turned it into a percent because I wanted to show all the zeros and the near zeros and just show you what it looks like in almost every specialty. We have inexorable zero percentages of black women professors and Hispanic women professors, Latino women professors. That's really remarkable in a country as diverse as the United States with so many talented, talented women in medicine and science. So this um, article was published by um, Helitzer et al. And, and you know, one of the things they said is this idea of critical mass theory, which is sort of the pipeline theory. Um, you know, as soon as there's enough people in the pipeline, as soon as there's a critical mass, and critical mass is thought to be about 30%, as soon as there's about 30%, things will change on their own. The New England Journal of Medicine study shows you that they don't change on their own. And so have a bunch of other studies. And by the way, the, the study by Richter et al. came out after this, this report came out. And, and um, Helitzer et al. said, don't believe critical mass theory. It's been disproven. It doesn't work. Things don't change just on their own. Instead, we have to really think about critical actors. And so I often think, you know, that's what this is. That's why I'm here with you today. This is critical actor training. Um, this is really like, how do we think, how do we become critical actors in change? And I think this is a really important opportunity. Before we get to that, let's just talk about what the gatekeepers are and for rank promotion. Okay, this is also for just promotion in general, but let's just talk about rank promotion or an academic uh, medicine career. There's four main gatekeepers. There, the med schools or the academic medical centers, you know, where you where your home institution is. There's NIH and other funders. There's medical societies and there's journals. Those are the four main gatekeepers. Now, I focus a lot of my work on the two in the box here, professional societies and journals, and I'm going to talk about why. But there's a really important reason why I focus so much of my work, and it has to do with the money, because money really makes the world go round. So the reason that I focus on this is it's the medical societies, it's the only way that the money flows in the opposite direction, right? It's the only time that out of our departments, we are paying another organization to support our faculty. We set aside huge amounts of money, gigantic amounts of money at Harvard Medical School and U Chicago and any institution in professional fees to send our people, our diverse faculty to medical societies so that they can be promoted. That means we have leverage. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So here is a young woman at Harvard Medical School in residency training, and she sends me this picture and she says, Dr. Silver, I know that you study medical societies and I want you to see what it looks like to me. I'm being asked to pay out of pocket to join this medical society, to take time away from my family to go to this medical society. And this is what it looks like to me. And I want you to just notice that her skin has a little bit um, more melanin than my skin and she has an intersectional identity. 
And this is what we are asking her to do. So this created a bit of a moral crisis for me when I got when I became a leader, because I would have to counsel all these early career folks and literally tell them to spend their own money because we always we give them a professional fees, but there's never enough. So they're, we're always asking them to go beyond what we've set aside in the professional fees to pay even more money. And these folks have high education debt. A lot of them don't have generational wealth, high education debt and, and inequitable compensation as a starting point. And now we're asking them to go sit in the audience and applaud something that looks like this. That's a problem. As I thought about it, I thought, well, I could just tell them not to join medical societies, right? But then how are they gonna get promoted? And we're gonna talk about what, what that looks like, but it's almost impossible to get promoted if you don't go over to the professional societies. So what happens? We have not only the workforce affected, but what about patients? Does this affect patients at all? And this was a grant that I received um, to look at, to really, um, you know, they called it mapping the landscape, to look at the science that, was, that existed regarding workforce disparities and how they affect patient care. And this was the first review that did that. So as we get into this, Let's think about, because because there's so many problems to solve and it can feel so overwhelming. And I was just in a meeting right before I came in this room um, where um, you know many of the faculty were saying like, there's so many things like, where do we start and how do we do this? You know, how can we solve the most critical ones? So let's really talk about that. And that's where a lot of my work thinking about like, what are the tipping points? What would really drive change? Because we can't solve everything at once. If we know that it's been 35 years and we don't have progress in terms of getting um, people to the women to the top positions. We know we can't solve everything at once. We have to figure out the tipping points, the things that'll really, really drive. And as you try to figure out the tipping points, you always have three arguments or three barriers, three things that drive it. One is the clinical argument you know, this is better for patient care. The second one, it's it's ethical and it's the right thing to do. And that's what all of you are really thinking a lot about. And the third one is financial. And I'm going to suggest to you that change is going to happen at the financial level more than it's going to happen at other levels, but that all arguments are important. So you're going to see the financial argument throughout my work. I'm going to come prepared to talk about the money. And I'm going to recognize that the people that I need to convince are not the people that already agree with me. And they are also not the people who are never going to change. They're really what we call the early majority. And the early majority I think of as reasonable people who haven't really thought about these ideas a lot, maybe don't have the data and need, and we need to spend more time with them. So if we can convince the early majority to focus on these tipping points, and to, that could really drive change. So I always go places to talk about the science, and I'm always there for the early majority. I don't go for the people that already agree with me. It, we can do a quick fist bump, we're good, it's all good. I'm always there for the early majority, and I never go for the people that are confirmed racist or whatever, I'm never there for them. So let's talk about critical actor training. Ready? There's only one problem, and if you were just in the meeting uh, with me, you don't, don't yell it out. Let's see, if, let's see if anyone else can get this, this issue. There's only one problem that has these characteristics that I can find. There's only one, and it's a really big tipping point, and it's really, really interesting. There's only one issue that's basically been documented in medical journals for more than 20 years. It's easy to fix and there's no financial cost to fix it. Does anyone know what that is? You can yell it out if you want. There's only one. It's journal editors. 
It's the only one. All right, so we have all this data. Tons. There's way more articles even than, than this. But we have study after study after study showing this. It doesn't cost any more to have a woman have that, that um, editor role versus a man. And we know that tons of journals have fixed this. So we know it's easy to fix. And we also know that a bunch of um, editors have written about it and said that it's easy to fix and it doesn't take very much time. We also know it's on the promotions criteria. So this is promotions criteria at Harvard Medical School, but this is very similar to other places. And we know that being an editor is part of the promotions criteria. Now keep in mind, remember all of those zeros and those inexorable zeros that I showed you about rank promotion? So when you look at my work, you're going to see that I've gone that I've done studies on almost every single one of these promotions criteria. I've just checked them off and I've tried to make the financial argument for those. And this is part of it is that we hire women in medicine and they end up leaving and it costs a lot of money. Attrition costs a ton of money. And part of that is they they, you know, face barriers to promotion, to getting published, etc. So I've written about this a lot. Um, I've written about this in The Lancet. This is um, an article in, in British Medical Journal. I've written about this, and one of the things is, and again, this, there's this relationship between medical societies and journals. Many medical societies own or are affiliated with journals. And so what I've said to them is, medical societies, you are not off the hook if you have a journal that has not fixed its editorial board yet. You are not off the hook. In fact, this whole idea of firewalls has to do with content in a study. Um, you're not supposed to have a medical society weighing in on the content in a study, but if you own or are affiliated with a journal, it is your responsibility to make sure that journal behaves ethically and that there are women equitably represented on that editorial board. That is your job. And that is compatible with a position of trust. So there was this racist podcast that many of you know, you might've talked about it in, in your ethics rounds. There's a racist podcast um, and it was um, produced at JAMA and people were very, very upset, but it was the tip of the iceberg. It was never about the racist podcast. It was always about everything that came before that. And what came before that? Well, one thing you can see right here in the purple with the purple lines is they that the journals weren't even reporting on racism that it wasn't even part of what the of the work that they were doing right i mean imagine that that was really really problematic and then they talked about medicines privileged gatekeepers producing harmful ignorance about racism and health right so I talked about this issue of not having gender equity on editorial boards about five years ago or so before the pandemic in a room full of women chairs and deans. And one woman got up and she said, for all the journals that aren't equitable at this time, let's take out an ad in the New York Times and just put the names of the editors and chiefs in the journals in that in the newspaper. You know, I, 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 I thought that was really interesting idea. And there's different ways to change things and you all can talk about that. Um, but one of the things that struck me was when this came out, it did make the front page of the New York Times. If you're, if you're not gonna be ethical and you're not gonna handle yourself in an ethical way, you may end up in the New York Times one way or another. So here are a couple of examples of editors including um, the new editor of the journal of neurology. And I'm going to um, give an example from the, the um, editor who, who recently left, but the new editor of the journal of neurology came and just changed the board. And at the time I actually gave talks a few years ago and I've showed the neurology editorial board for the American Academy of Neurology. I would show their editorial board and I would show that there were no women neurologists from the United States on their editorial board. Of the American Academy 
of neurology. You can't find anyone. There, it's a pipeline issue, right? There are no women neurologists at Harvard, at Stanford, at U Chicago, or any of the tremendous state schools, et cetera. They're just not available. Or we have an ethics issue that's really, really troubling, deeply, deeply troubling. So let's talk about tipping points beyond editors for a minute about the medical societies and recognition awards. So I decided to use recognition awards, again, part of the criteria for promotion because of what you saw the woman holding and because of what I saw in my specialty. So in my specialty, there'd be an auditorium at our conferences that would be five times, 10 times as big as this, filled with people. And for the most recent four years in a row when I did this study, zero women physicians received awards. Imagine sitting there clapping as man after man after man received awards. As a leader in academic medicine who has encouraged women to spend their own money, leave their little kids at home, travel across the country and participate in that medical society, that was a problem. So I decided that I was going to tell people the truth. I was going to be honest. I was going to say, We're, we, we have this system in academic medicine. This is how it works. But boy, do we need to open some doors and we need to open it fast. And the work that I was doing on medical societies really created a, a specialty, a, sub, a subspecialty of, of investigation on medical societies, except for the journals, the journal editors. That was the only issue that had really been reported on with medical societies before I started reporting on this, before I started just hammering away at this. That the only one that had been reported was the journal editor issue. And of course, as soon as I started showing this, people said, well, women need to nominate more women. It's a women's problem. And I said, well, first of all, deans and chairs are the ones that typically um, nominate, but let's take a look at this. We looked at nominations. And in the early career category, women were nominated, really amazing women were not nominated, and they never made it out of committee. And in the mid-career category, no woman was nominated, none. No one nominated women in mid-career. So we had two different issues. One was a nomination issue, and one was an issue in the, at the committee. Almost always, causality is multifactorial. So of course, I didn't wanna be a recognition award researcher. That's not my goal in life. What I wanted to do was show that medical societies, which is a collection of billion dollars, you know, many billions in, of these businesses, and you can pull the 990s, and I have pulled their 990s, and I've reported on it in the Her Time Is Now report and, and shown all the, the, the money. Um, I wanted to, to basically turn this equation around and make sure that we were supporting everyone equitably. So I went after the zeros or the inexorable zeros. And I just said, look, it's not just one specialty. It's all these different specialties. They are zeros everywhere or inexorable zeros. And in fact, I did this study with colleagues and we looked at 63 years, 63 years. And in this paper, we put every award and who received it. And when you open this paper and read this paper, you know exactly what award we're talking about. You can see the little icons for men versus women who received it, et cetera. It's very clear. And also one in four categories demonstrated zero to 18% representation among women, among physicians during the most recent decade. That's a problem. And it's why we have all those zeros in rank promotion at the top. Now, we talked about journal editors and they're very powerful, they're gatekeepers, right? So maybe as a little bit of a swan song, the journal editor, as he was leaving, for the journal Neurology decided to do a study looking at recognition awards and also um, authors, publications. 
So let's take a look at that, at that study that the editor did. And also one of the other authors was, um, uh, was the, the man in charge of membership at the AAN. Interesting, interesting to become a gender equity researcher when you're, when you're not actually a gender equity researcher, but, and I'm not sure how that happened, but let's just see what, what the study looks like. So in light of recent research highlighting inequities in these domains, i.e. my study with colleagues and others, um, they looked at three years over a 20 year span. So 85% of the awards were not examined. 85%, we looked at a 63 year consecutive history. Like, I, I'm not sure how you decide on a methodology like that. This, this is very much outside the box of methodology for recognition award studies. So three out of 20 years is 15%. So 85% of the, of the years, they didn't look at the awards. And they found that women were proportionally more likely to receive recognition awards in, in all of the years studied, i.e. three. Wow. So now what you see actually in different papers is they'll, people will say, oh, there was a problem with recognition awards, but it's been fixed. That is somewhat true in, in terms of the AAN is doing a better job, but I'm not convinced that this study shows it. And I'm also not convinced that women were overrepresented for recognition awards. However, we decided to just tackle in this study how our work was misrepresented. And so we wrote a letter to the editor and said, do not misrepresent our work. We are gender equity researchers. We know what we're doing. Let's talk about clinical practice guidelines. Again, on the promotions criteria, right? Representation of female authors got a lot of attention um, starting in 2018 in the Lancet. And they basically showed that among all these different specialties that women were underrepresented and especially women physicians. And then just recently, they showed that, um, that uh, they, they, they categorized racialized individuals using coding methodology. So in the, in the Lancet, um, they showed that minority individuals, especially minority women, that little tiny box at the top are very underrepresented. At the same time, we did a study using coding. And this is really interesting because in the past, it's basically been okay to code for gender, especially if you use, um, if you can identify he, she pronouns or they pronouns, they, them pronouns, et cetera, you can, you can do that. But it hasn't been as acceptable to code for race and ethnicity. And many of us have been having this really strong discussion about, my goodness, even our, if our data aren't perfect, we've got to start coding because the, if, if we wait for everyone to just self-identify race, then basically you have a limitation and a methodology um, of your methodology, which is not everybody's going to respond. And so you always have an incomplete sample size, right? And you're all, and those people could be the very people who, you know, um, it may be that, more, for example, more Black people are not responding or something. And so it messes up. Either way, it's a significant limitation. So we did this study using coding methodology. And the Lancet study came out at the same time. And both of us said, we believe we're the first to come out with this, um, but it's great that, that people are talking about this and that we're pushing this agenda forward. Um, it's a tough agenda, but again, um, women were underrepresented. So now let's talk about this issue of clinical practice guidelines. How do they even get made? Well, most of them are produced by medical societies and published in, they're affiliated journals, 
right? Starting to see why I study this. And one of the things that I decided to do is I started to say, you know, fair trade was a social movement that basically said, here's these two organizations, buyers and producers, and buyers started to say, hey, if you have unethical behaviors as an organization, i.e. you use forced labor, you use child labor, you don't pay, pay fair wages, we're not going to buy from you. We're, and again, the financial argument, right? We're not giving you our money. So I thought, well, what if I could get organizations to stop turning a blind eye and start getting them to behave ethically, including with, with whoever they support? So the journal Cell came to me and said, Dr. Silver, we know you're one of the leading gender equity experts. We want to really push the envelope. We want to do something out of the box. We really care about making a difference with gender equity. And I thought, I'm going to um, come up with a term for this problem. I'll call it interorganizational structural discrimination. And I'll give it criteria. And I did this with colleagues. I invited colleagues to work with me on this. And there's, it's two or more organizations voluntarily work together. So it's a voluntary relationship, not like, you know, a hospital that has to work with a state agency or something. It's two organizations that, that agree to work together and they can sever the relationship easily if they want to. One has a structural discrimination issue and the issue is fixable. So let's take a look at this example. We have this clinical practice guideline. We have... 46 men and three women. Wow. So we have an inexorable zero. We have 10 other medical societies supporting this, 10. And these clinical practice guidelines are going to be distributed throughout the United States affecting patient care and throughout the world because that's, because we are so respected here in the United States that our clinical practice guidelines are used throughout the world and they drive billions of dollars, billions in patient care. One clinical practice guideline can drive a huge amount of money to something or away from something. So let's take a look at these organizations. Here's all the participating societies. So my um, you know, message to them is you cannot support a medical society that produces a clinical practice guideline or a journal that, that publishes a clinical practice guideline that has 46 men authors and three women. You must hold them accountable. You must not participate in interorganizational structural discrimination. This is a known fixable problem. Let's talk about compensation. I've done a lot of studies on compensation. One of the things that one of the things I studied was just that women were mostly doing the compensation studies. And they were mostly citing the compensation studies and they were mostly distributing them on social media and they were also mostly not funded. And then we looked at race studies and we found that there's not very many of them. There's very few studies that look at race and compensation, which is a travesty. And it's really important to do more studies on this. I also want to just show you that, that the, the inequities are baked in. So urology has mostly men physicians, and gynecology has mostly women physicians. But for doing a penile versus a, a vaginal biopsy, it's a pretty similar skill set but men get paid a lot more to do that work. So they're just baked in to the system in ways that define structural discrimination. So as we looked at um, this issue of compensation, we decided to kind of move beyond specialty choice, et cetera, and start looking at what were the decisions that women were making based on um, high education debt. And we found that they weren't going on vacations, they weren't taking time off, um, they weren't um, going to professional society meetings, et cetera. 
that based on this high education debt, what I call the financial stress equation, so unfair compensation together with high education debt, that is a very stressful situation to be in. And speaking of compensation, I'm going to bring this back around to editors again, because it's kind of interesting. One of the ways that, that the unaccounted for compensation is actually comes from industry. So when we, we know we have open payments and we can look at these things. And so we did a new study looking at in the pathology editors, the editors and chiefs of pathology journals. And guess what we found over the um, 10 year or so period that we studied? Guess how much money total the top woman made? It's in millions. Just throw a number out there. What, did you say 1 million? Okay, one, yeah, double that. Two, 2 million. Guess how much the top male editor made? Eight, five, go up. 20, go up. What? 43? Is that what somebody said? 47. $47 million. Yeah, wow. That's coming out. That's our paper coming out. What about the work environment? Harassment. We know that medicine has a problem with harassment. And this has really, I think, mislabeled a lot of men. There are so many good men in medicine but we have an issue with not taking care of people who, who harass repeatedly, right? And I started talking about this. And when this report first came out, I would talk to groups of, of early career folks and you could just see the men's faces in the rooms fall. And they would see these harassment numbers. And I was like, come on guys, wait a second. Let's understand how stats work and, and what, this, what happens is these are serial harassers. These are serial harassers for the most part. The vast majority of men in medicine are good people. They don't harass women. But we are not taking care of the ones that serial harass. And that is a problem for everyone. It creates an incredibly toxic situation. And Francis Collins said, look, NIH has been part of the problem. We have to fix this. We are going to start holding people accountable. And I think that, you know, it's, it's morally indefensible. I mean, really, it's morally indefensible. So how do we solve these equity issues? I really like to focus on tipping points. I encourage people to focus on tipping points. I think it makes a difference. Colleagues have started to, um, to do other studies looking at the work that we're doing. Here's two colleagues in Canada and they literally contacted me and said, we're just doing the same studies you've been doing and doing them in Canada in our medical societies too. And we've collaborated, et cetera. And you know, they're, they're um, allies doing that. This is a task force that I led for, um, I co-led for the Association of Academic Physiatrists, the one that had all those zeros um, for the past four years. We looked at all the metrics, the society metrics, and we, in a three-year period, we published a follow-up report to show how we changed those metrics. This is the only report that's like this. The only medical society that I know of that's reported their before and after and had a strategy. And when I go give talks, I give a lot of talks. I always like to have men in the room. I'm always there for the early majority. And this is an example of an early majority. And he wrote to me afterwards. He was, um, you know, the, the um, vice dean of research and basically said, I know what you're doing. You, you're trying to make sure that I know that I could end up being a, a laggard, that that could be my legacy. He goes, I, I'm on to you, but I don't want to be a laggard. I'm going to step up. And that, that, this is the person that I'm always going to talk to, and, and that, that's how change happened. So this is a, um, a problem that is universal. Women stand in line to go to the bathroom. I was an engineering major in my first couple of years of college, and I can tell you at 18 years old, my first year in college, this was a very simple engineering problem. It's a design thinking problem. 
You basically figure out how long it takes um, women versus men to go to the bathroom, what your throughput is, et cetera, and you design a bathroom that works. If you've ever not been able to recognize your privilege, and if you are able to walk by a line like this and go into a bathroom that's open, you have a lot of privilege. Women have time poverty. So let's talk about the fix the women versus fix the structure. We could fix the women. We could put them all in menopause right away, right? We could, we can do that. We can tell women, don't take your kids to the bathroom, right? Don't take your elderly mother to the bathroom. We could make it so women go to the bathroom faster. That's the fix the women solution. Or we could fix the structure. We could say, look, women don't have to behave like men. They don't have to behave like men. They can actually just be women and it's okay. Let's fix the structure. So this is um, a true story, medical society, you know, um, a task force convened, 20 women working on it, et cetera, to try to get a lactation room. Now I, I um, put on conferences. I can tell you I have lactation rooms and I know how much they cost and I know how hard they are to book and it's not a big deal. This is like one dean or chair just calling up and saying, hey, like I wanted to make sure this gets done. This is a really simple problem to fix. And so this is my message. Solve the problem and stop wasting women's time. This is a sports medicine course. Kind of an irony of all the men posted, you know, in the background with a group of sports medicine physicians at the course. I developed the sports medicine course at Harvard Medical School, supporting my colleagues. And this is what our course looks like. There's a lot of amazing women in sports medicine. And they know the science and there is no reason to leave them out. And when you talk to people, they'll say, oh, there's hardly any women in sports medicine. We can't find them anywhere. Did you look? Did you look at UChicago? Did you look at Harvard? Did you look at University of Texas, UCLA? Did you look? Did you invite them? And did you pay them fairly? A few things to remember. This is a study we just did looking at the American um, Board of Medical Specialties. And it was a reanalysis. We did a reanalysis because one of the things that we're trying to show now is we put it in the literature and you didn't change. And we are going to hold your feet to the fire until you do change. And so we did this reanalysis to show that you cannot assume progress and that you must be accountable. And at the end of the day, what I say is this is really like the, the um, you know, the workforce triple aim is really like the patient care triple aim. So for those of you that are familiar with the triple aim, basically you have to do three things at once. You have to improve patient outcomes, make the patients happier, and do it for less cost. You have to do all three. It's very easy to do one of them. It's very easy to do two of them. It's super hard to do three of them. That's what value-based care is. You have to do all three of these things. If you just pay equitably, but ever, all the women stay at the, at the um, assistant professor level, that's not gonna work. If you pay them equitably and promote them equitably, but you harass them like crazy, that's not gonna work. You've got to do all three of these things simultaneously. And I just, I wanna remind people that women are physically working harder than men very frequently. There's a lot of studies that show this in so many different ways that physically women are working hard, that the world is not set up for them. They're standing in line to go to the bathroom. They're literally working harder in the operating room. And then we're asking them to do a lot of extra work, citizenship work, and that they're frequently voluntold to do these things. That there's really not an option. You can't, you, you have to do this because your chair or whatever asked you to do this. And that you're working in an environment that was never designed for you in the first place. And that can make you feel like an imposter and you're not. You're not an imposter. 
No one that gets this far is an imposter. You always have three options. Um, you can lean in, but if you lean in all the time, you're going to get beat up and it's going to be hard to survive that way. And so I always say lean in when it's appropriate, but also you can lean around and up or you can just sit tight and wait it out and see what happens. You don't have to lean in all the time. It is very dangerous and very hard in academic medicine to lean in all the time. You always have options. Hope is not a strategy. We have to commit ourselves to actually driving change and to being good allies. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Silver. So we're gonna be open for questions. Um, I'm just gonna ask the first one because um, it, I have actually two questions burning in my mind, but I'm asked the first one. The, it was about your data on awards, and um, and one was it that um, you were there was nominations, and then people who got awards. And one of the things we found is by nominating people, we got more people awards. But it didn't look like that was the case in your early data that the women didn't make it out of the nomination. So I wonder if you think that's changed, or is nominating women for awards enough? Right. So, uh, so there's a, a quite a bit of literature on um, nominations. Um, looking at the um, uh, Raise Project, and um, they've been looking at women award women uh, getting awards for a long time. Most of the time, we don't study causality. We find disparities, but we don't study causality. And causality is almost always multifactorial. There's almost always more than one thing that's happening um, when you when you reach the point of a disparity, et cetera. Um, so looking at nominations, um, we have seen improvements with nominations when, when they increase. But a lot of those nominations are coming from women nominating women. So the underrepresented group is nominating themselves. And again, women have time poverty and they are um, you know, not receiving equitable pay, et cetera. Many nominations are driven by chairs and deans. The majority of those positions are held by men. So it's really important to make sure that all of our leaders, regardless of gender, and there's a gender spectrum and non-binary and so on, but regardless of who's holding those positions is really thinking about all of the qualified candidates to receive these awards and, and that it doesn't fall on the underrepresented group or the oppressed group to be do, to be fixing the problem. Any other questions? Yes, Dr. Rara. Um, that was amazing. Um, I saw that. Um, Sure. So the question really is, as we recruit um, more people from underrepresented groups, whether they're women or um, LGBTQ um, community, people with disabilities, uh, race, ethnic um, minorities, you know, how can we help protect them in these leadership positions? And it, it's really interesting because, you know, we have these conversations a lot. I'm sure you've had this um, conversation with a lot of colleagues. It is really hard to be alone in a leadership position. It is lonely the higher you go when you're from an underrepresented group. And, um, you know, I think that, that there's a number of ways to uh, facilitate kind of protecting someone. I do a lot of that at the women's leadership course that I direct at Harvard Medical School. Um, you know, lots of strategies. One of them, for example, is when you're going to present at a meeting, have meetings before the meeting to make sure you have allies in the meeting. I mean, that's a ridiculous amount of work though, right? Because now you have to sit there and before the meeting, you know, make sure that, that what you're saying is going to, you're going to have allies at the table. 
Um, we talk a lot about situational awareness and just making sure that you, you know, you understand your situation. And, and again, that's where the lean in and, you know, sit tight and things. Another thing is, you know, when we hire somebody for, to be the DEI person, if that person's job is to recruit all their, you know, all their colleagues and, and, and people across the system who are also underrepresented and ask them to volunteer and dedicate their time, that's not a great strategy. That just puts them deeper in the hole, deeper in the, in the you know, how do you get out of education, um, you know, educational debt by doing clinical work usually, or by doing research and getting grants and so on. So, um, so one of the things is, is to truly empower those people. And that comes down to money. They have to have big budgets. They have to be in charge of the strategy. They have to be in charge of their budget in charge of their budget, accountable for the metrics and the change and so on, but they have to have the money to do that work. And we all know that people that are being hired into DEI positions are not giving the money and the power to drive change. I have some questions I'm gonna to read to you from the, from the Zoom. So um, one is from Dr. Singh. Um, is there any data on gender equity in different academic tracks, for instance, School of Medicine versus a tenure research track? Yeah, there there are, um, you know, different ones. Um, Dr. Reshma Jagsi has done a lot of research um, looking at uh, various things like that. Um, so that's one person's work to look at. There's, there's, uh, you know, quite a bit of gender equity work done in medicine and science um, and the, the connection and crossover between those. Good. So I'm going to read this next one. Um, thank you, Dr. Silver, for your important work highlighting these inequities and motivating some at the top to make changes. One pattern I've noticed is that people are willing to make some systemic changes, like having a lactation room, um, but are less willing to confront behaviors and values that create hostile workplaces for women and push them out of academia. How do we encourage leaders to realize that women don't have to behave like men, as you put it? Great. Um, so I think one of the ways that that we do that is is to literally say it out loud and say that women don't have to. Um, I can tell you that the way that I present is different than the way that I was taught to present and the way that most men present. And I'm fine with that because I'm not going, I'm not trying to turn myself into a man. I'm trying to be a, an intelligent, competent woman in academic medicine. A really good example of that is this. As, as we do research, people start saying, okay, so now you're going to open up editorial positions for people, and now you're going to open up speakers um, and so on. And so women need to start stepping up and doing that. They need to step up and do it. And I was like, well, first of all, maybe we should pay them to step up, number one. And number two, they don't have to step up in the same way that men have to step up. Let's get the metric right. So if we're going to have a sports medicine course, let's not say we're only going to include women if they say yes as quickly as the men. If we have to invite five women to get one spot filled and only one man to get one spot filled, then that doesn't mean we're gonna like make the metric super lopsided because that's the excuse a lot. Well, the women, they, they, it takes longer. They say no. They're, well, they take longer and they say no because they're not being paid because they're doing so much volunteer work because they're standing in line to go to the bathroom. And I mean, I mean, it's ridiculous, the number of things, right? So get to the metric. If it takes you, if you're a course director, you adjust your thinking and you say, I have to invite as many people as it takes to get the metric right. And then we, we put women in powerful positions as speakers, et cetera. By the way, we got to that metric because I showed our course directors. First of all, I developed that course with them. But for all of our courses, I showed them year after year what their own metrics were in, in aggregate and then privately. And then I showed them also how much money they were paying people and also who the keynotes were, et cetera. And so they started to see, they're like, oh, like I'm gonna have to meet again with Dr. Silver and I'm gonna have to review my numbers. 
and she's going to show me I didn't have any women keynotes and I paid men more and I had this lot. And so they're going to be like, they're going to change their behavior. And that's one of the ways that we do it. We don't say that women have to start acting like men in order to be invited. They don't. And that goes for editors too, because I hear this a lot. Well, you know, we haven't, um, we, they don't have, they haven't been in the system, so they can't be editors in chief. First of all, a, a number of people have went, gone right to editor in chief without going up in the system or whatever. That's number one. And number two, when you're talking about editors who have um, high education debt and are not paid fairly, then you have to start thinking about, are you really going to ask them to start at the bottom and volunteer? Or are you going to start changing the structure so that they'll say yes? If you change the structure, it means that you start paying them. And if you don't think there's money to pay them, please look at my Her Time Is Now report because I pulled the 990s and I showed the money so you can see that there's plenty of money to pay these women to be editors. I had... Um... I had one last question and that is um, the data. Like you, the one thing I've been so impressed is like you are like driven by data, like data for awards, data for editors. And I, I've also found that data works when you're showing data, like people respond to that. But I'm, I'm a little perplexed by how to display the data, like institutional data, you know, how to display a journal's data. Should, be, should it be public to everyone? Is it just the leaders looking at it? Like how can you use data um, in the strongest way both at an institution, but also in an organization. So it's, you have, the question is really how to, how to use data. And, you know, there's different ways and I do it in different, um, in different ways to drive change. It depends. Um, you know, when you're in an institution and you're, and you're showing institutional data, you do have to be a little careful about the institution's reputation. But one of the things a lot of people don't realize is that there's data everywhere. So if you go to Web of Science, and that's what Harvard uses for its um, bibliometrics, its H index and its promotion criteria. When you go to Web of Science, you see all the different collaborators that that person has collaborated with. And you can see whether that person has collaborated with women. You can see whether that person has collaborated with people of color, with BIPOC individuals, et cetera. So your legacy is out there. And, and I always say, please don't be afraid of your own data. Take a look at it and then make it better. You know, we all have blind spots and we all have areas that we need to work on being better allies and so on. We all have that, but that data is there. So don't be afraid of your own data. Um, on the other hand, I mean, I don't go out of my way to embarrass people or whatever. That is not, that's never the point of my work. My work in, you know, that's why I said for the courses, I would show it in aggregate to, er, to all of the course directors. And then I would take them aside individually and have a conversation with them. You know, what are the barriers? Why are, why do your numbers look like this? What can we do about it, et cetera? Thank you. Any other last questions? Otherwise we'll um, wrap up the session and we'll stop the recording. Um, and thank you to our Zoom uh, attendees. We're gonna finish with, um, some time with the ethics fellows right now. So thank you so much for your talk. And um, we're gonna, ask, let me just stop the recording really fast. Okay, pause or stop the recording. Yeah, so um, I think there are some of you who are ethics fellows in the room. We're gonna um, take Dr. Silver up to the, eth the, the ethics library um, on the seventh floor. Um, she'll eat her lunch up there and then she'll meet and talk with you and have some more time for questions up there. Yes, absolutely. Which yeah, one is? You can join if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi.